بيتي الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم brothers and sisters uh, first question I think this is a very f I, like, I like to answer this one especially to an audience like yourself can a Sayyid marry a non-Sayyid yes a Sayyid can marry a non-Sayyid this is a practice, this, this business about hormat between sadat and non-sadat is something I find particular to the Indo-Pakistani subcontinent. You don't find it anywhere else in the Shia world. Um, and I think it is a part of your cultural experience because coming from a, an historical Hindu background, you have this idea about caste system and you have Brahmins, for example, cannot marry Kshatriyas and Sudras and so forth. And so we have this idea where, for example, you know, you kind of bring across uh, a, a, a previous cultural attitude into Shia Islam, where you treat, for example, Sadat as Brahmins. And therefore it becomes something horrendous if a non-Sayyid marries a Sayyid. One interesting question I ask is, if this was such a restriction, why do the Sadat look like people from the Indo-Pakistani subcontinent? Why don't they look like Arabs? Because if Sayyids couldn't marry Sayyids, then you would have probably pure Arab stock, right, among the Shias. But when you go to Iran, you meet Shia, uh, sorry, Iranian Sayyids, and you go to Africa, you meet black Sayyids, and you go to India, and you meet Indian Sayyids. So, probably somebody wasn't following the rules. <laughs> so, no. Um, uh, I, I mean, look at the, 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 the example of our Imams. Okay? You know, they didn't marry any, any many of them didn't marry any women who were Sadat. They didn't marry um, among them uh, the um, women of the Quraysh, you know, or the Hashimis. But if you notice, um, some of them might have been married to um, Quraysh, like Imam Hassan alayhi salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi wa alayhi You know, um, but their offspring, you know, um, come from slaves, right? The offspring come from slaves. Imam, Imam uh, uh, Jawad was married to a Hashemi, but it is the Hashemi who killed him. Huh? And his slave bought, uh, bought, bought the imam uh, after him. So um, this is uh, one of these myths that I think uh, people are very, very emotionally connected with in, uh, in your community. And uh, you have to be revolutionaries, you know, right? I mean, you have to, as I was telling somebody, Islam is like pure distilled water, okay? You know, um, many of us not, would not be able to take pure Islam. So Islam becomes mixed with the cultures that it finds itself among. You know, Islam is not Arab culture per se. Islam is divine culture. And it mixes with the culture that uh, it encounters. And out of this, you have what one um, uh, Oriental, Orientalist scholar, Marshall Hudson, called an Islamicate culture. And so you'd find that wherever you go in the world, you would find different cultural expressions of Islam. There are certain things that are unchangeable, like, for example, marriage, like, for example, the, 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 the parts of marriage, you know, the contract and the walima, for example. But how the walima is expressed depends upon the culture. You know, in the end of the Pakistani subcontinent, maybe the brides would wear red, you know, goes back again to their background. In the West, they might wear white. It goes back again to their background. You know, but the, the, these parts remain. Witnesses have to be there. This remains. Salah, the use of the Arabic language in Salah, these things remain. Um, uh, however, other secondary aspects of Islamic practice, like dress, you know, like how you celebrate the different Eids and so forth, they tend to um, you know, be related to the culture in which it finds itself. The thing is, we have to be careful that we do not mix 
uh, or let our cultures confuse our practice of Islam. Because culture is something that is specific to a particular area. Right. Culture is something specific to a particular area. It is an interrelationship. It comes out of the, it comes out of the interrelationship between pe previ people's previous cultures, the historical experiences, and uh, their environment, uh, and how those things impact upon their practice of Islam, or how their Islam utilizes these elements in order for its practice. So then when you change, when you leave one environment and come to another, like you leave your home country and you come here, and you get into different types of social relationships and a different environment, it stands to reason that your Islamic culture will change. And I think this is one of the biggest reasons why you have this divide between the older generation and the younger generation. Because sometimes the older generation, well, oftentimes, um, tend to insist upon their children that they practice the home culture which in many cases would not be appropriate in this environment, in this social context, okay? So we have to be flexible. We have to be able to isolate those important unchanging principles of Islam and uh, look and see the dynamic transformation of the, of the practice of these principles in this new environment. When it becomes, when it becomes rooted in this environment, when the expression of Islam becomes uh, uh, part of this environment, then you would find many, many people embracing the deen. Right now, for a lot of people, this deen is something very strange. You know, especially when you're like our Salafi brothers are walking around the street with those uh, uh, long dresses. Yeah. Okay. Um, with their, with their um, designer running shoes. Um, can you explain why men are considered a degree higher than women? Allah doesn't say that men are a degree higher than women. He says he gives them something more. They have something more than women. This is on the outward level. This is on the level of the world. On the level of the spirit, men and women are equal. A good example of this is in the issue of Nubuwa of prophethood. We believe that a prophet could only be a man. A prophet cannot be a woman. That does not mean to say a woman cannot achieve the, uh, the spiritual status of a prophet without actually holding the social position. A good example of this is Hazrat Maryam with Zachariah. Hazrat Zachariah was the custodian of Hazrat Maryam. He was her guardian, and he was also a prophet of his people. He wasn't a rasul, he was a prophet. One of the differences between a rasul and a prophet is that a prophet could hear the angel, the angel of revelation, okay? Uh, he might be able to see him in a dream, but a prophet cannot see in a conscious state the angel of revelation, as a Jibrail. Hazrat Maryam had that particular status. Hazrat Maryam received many uh, visits from Angel Jibreel, and he brought food from heaven for her to the extent that Hazrat Zachariah was surprised. In other words, Hazrat Maryam, we can say, had a higher spiritual status than Hazrat Zachariah. Nevertheless, Hazrat Zachariah was the prophet and she was not. And he had authority over her. This is in the area of the Zahir. This is in the area of the world. In the world, in the dunya, we have hierarchy. We always must respect our parents. Even when we, be, we grow older and we become smarter than them and we become stronger than them, okay? And we could probably even realize some of the foolishness our parents had done in their past and probably are still doing. Nevertheless, we have to always show them respect and always obey them. This is the dunya. This is the zahir. 
man and woman are expressions of the names of Allah. As I mentioned to you before, there's a very famous hadith where um, the uh, Urafa, many of them use, where Allah says, I was a hidden treasure and I desired to be known. So I created creation or I created mankind in order to be known. So the, 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 the universe is as it were the self-disclosure of Allah. This is why Allah is always asking us to com contemplate the signs of his creation. Contemplate the sun, the moon, the, the stars, the trees, the rivers, everything. Because all of, all of them are what? Signs. Signs possess the names of Allah. Two of the highest signs of Allah are men and women. Men represent the, so, the, the sum total of the divine names. We call the names of the Zahir. The names, the outward names of Allah or the uh, names of majesty, or we would call them the masculine names of Allah. Masculine as not a gender, but as a quality, all right? So for example, men represent those names of Allah as the powerful, the ruler, the king, the, the judge, uh, the, the, the vengeful, you know, the one who takes life and so forth. This is Allah, the powerful. And this is the Allah we call upon us, we call upon when we want to combat with our enemies. We call him by these names. But Allah has another set of names, the names of beauty. These are what we could call the feminine names of Allah. Not that Allah has women's names, huh? the feminine name as a, as a quality. Okay, and a man can have a feminine quality about him without being a poof. You see? I'll give you a good example of, let's say, Muhammad Ali as a boxer. You know, compare him to Mike, Mike Tyson. Muhammad Ali was a virtual ballerina in the boxing ring. You know, but you couldn't stand up to a punch to Muhammad Ali. You see, this is a, 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 a you know, an athlete, you know, in a very brutal sport that has a certain finesse about him. This finesse is what we call the feminine quality. When you look at, uh, I don't know, what's his name? Uh, Ronaldinho and, and these guys, you know, they all look cute. huh? And they all play beautifully. They play with style, all right? This is a feminine quality, okay? So these are the feminine names of Allah. You know, the names of mercy, Rahman, Rahim. They come from the word Raham, which is womb, which is something explicitly feminine. You see? It's connected with women. And so love, mercy, tenderness, indulgence, you know, beauty. These are all the names of the, the feminine names of Allah that we, are, we, are, we call upon for ourselves. We call upon Allah to always forgive us. We don't call upon Allah to punish us. But we do call upon him to punish the bad guys. All right? Women represent these names especially, and men represent these names especially. And so, uh, one is the Zahir. One is the one that uh, has power. It, it, it displays itself. It must dominate this environment. Women, on the other hand, uh, shown in intimacy and nurturing and, and, and cultivation. Yeah? And so we in Islam, we separate these two qualities in terms of their functions in society. So because men are rulers, doesn't mean to say men should be dictators. That women are, are the ones who provide and the ones who tend to stay home and the ones who are tender and so on doesn't mean to say that there should be a floor mat for a man, a man to walk upon. And we see that, for example, women are not allowed usually to be soldiers. Why? Soldiers take life. This is an aspect of the Jalali names, the majestic names of Allah. But women give life. So women are not encouraged to be soldiers, to take life and so on. So in other words, Islamic society is a dhikr of Allah, is a means whereby we remember Allah. One of the problems of modern society is that we forget this. And so everybody is all mixed up into one. And usually, we all mixed up in the Jalali names, mixed up in the names of majesty. When you look at some feminists, for example, there ain't nothing feminine about these guys. They're very masculine. They want your job. <laughs> they want to wear your suit. You know, they don't, want to, they don't even want to look attractive. Or the, upper, the opposite extreme, where they want to look, quote unquote, sexy and at the same time say, this is empowering, you know? So you have a really confused society that we live in. Um, 
And well, somebody, some eight-year-old person said, why are men separated from women? Uh, men are separated from women in public situations like this, for example, in order for us to be able to concentrate properly, especially men. Okay? Men don't concentrate properly when they're around women. I, I, used to, I was a Christian. I used to go to church just to concentrate on the women. Um, If somebody asked me to name a book, any more questions? That's it. Um, to name a book um, that deals with Salafi claims, I, I really couldn't tell you. There are some of them. I mean, just ask maybe your neighborhood bookstore or something. I'm sure there would be some available. Um, can you please explain about the, 30, the 313 helpers of Imam Mahdi? What are their characteristics? Um, I think, you know, um, what I can say, what I think is important here to say about being a helper of Imam Mahdi, may Allah hasten his return. Is that you have two kinds of followers, right? You have two kinds of followers. You have a follower who, when they're given a task and they finish the task, they look at the boss and they say, what next, right? You have a soldier who's following a, a captain. You know, the captain says, you know, let's do X. And when they do X, they, 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 they wait for more orders. And then you have another type of follower, another type of soldier who has leadership qualities himself, right? And who could anticipate the needs or views of the leader who would do things without necessarily having to be asked because he could put himself in that particular leadership position in his mind and know how the leader thinks. Of course, it becomes clear that the second type of follower is the better follower. We are also imamiya. We are also following the, the imamiya Islam. And imamia means the, the Islam of imams. And therefore, we should have an imami role to play in our society. This was the major difference between Imam Khomeini, rahmatullahi and all the other uh, Shia ulama, most of the other Shia ulama, big mm -hmm. ulama. In the sense that many of them thought that because in the absence of the imam, we do not have the responsibility of taking, taking control. Of, of, of trying to reform our society and creating, you know, uh, a, a better structure and a better system. You see, they were just waiting for him to come back. And he said, no, this is not the right way. What you have to do is to anticipate his coming. In other words, we all have to be a little, little imams in our own little f uh, frame of, 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 of activity. Why? Because when he comes back, he wants somebody who is active in that. Okay, not just waiting, but preparing the way for him. You see, and I think this is one of the most important things. We have to be like him. And, um, you know, there's a, a, a hadith where, for example, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, uh, is, um, is talking about himself and uh, Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Fatima to Zahra alayhim salam, um, where he likens himself to a tree. And he says that he is like the trunk of the tree. And Imam Ali alayhi salam and Hazrat Fatima to Zahra salam alayha are like the branches of that tree. And the imams being branches, sub, uh, subordinate branches to those branches. And interestingly, he says, and the Shia are like the leaves that come out on those branches. That whenever a Shia is born, a leaf comes out, and when he dies, it falls off. In other words, we share spiritually something with the Ahlul Bayt, alayhim salam. We are not just mere followers of them. We share in the spiritual substance of them. There's some hadith that said that the Shia of the Ahlul Bayt salam, are created from the leftover clay that was used to create the Ahlul Bayt salam. So therefore, you know, on a metaphysical level, you know, we are bound to behave like them. We are bound to act like them, to do like them. And so we have a responsibility, like, an, like the Imam, to uh, reform 
whichever small part of the world we are in that we can handle. This is our job. And in this particular way, we would be worthy of being called uh, followers of the Imam, insha'Allah. Um, to uh, get on with the topic at, at hand, uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah. Wa ala wa ala wahirati lat lati halla bifinaik. Alaika minni salamu lahi abada ma baki tu baki alaylu wa nahar. Assalamu ala al Hussein. Wa ala Ali ibn al Hussein. Wa ala ulad al Hussein. Wa ala ashab al Hussein. I would like to make a couple of comments on repentance because again, you know, uh, we had mentioned Hor two days ago. And uh, Hor is the um, most poignant case of repentance and the role of repentance in the whole uh, struggle uh, on the plains of Karbala. And uh, I'd like to mention two verses um, that illustrate how important repentance is in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Allahu yuhibbul muhsineen, waladheena idha fa'alu fahishatan, aw dhalamu anfusahum, dhakaru allaha, fastaghfaru li dhunubihim, wa man yaghfaru dhunuba illa Allah. وَلَمْ يُسِيرُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ أُولَئِكَ جَزَاؤُهُمْ مَغْفِرَةٌ مِّن رَبِّهِمْ وَجَنَّاتٌ تَجْرِي مِّن تَحْتِهَا الْأَنْهَارِ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا وَنِعْمَ أَجْرُ الْعَامِلِينَ says, and Allah loves the virtuous and those who when they commit an act of corruption or wrong themselves, remember Allah and please and plead for forgiveness for them for their sins. And who forgives sins except Allah? And who do not persist in what they have committed while they know? Their reward is forgiveness from their Lord and gardens with streams running in them to remain in them forever. How excellent! is the reward of the workers. And Allah also says, إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمَلَ عَمَلًا صَالِحًا فَأُولَٰئِكَ يُبَدِّلُ اللَّهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ حَسَنَاتٍ وَكَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورًا رَحِيمًا Allah says, except those who repent, have faith, and act righteously for such people, Allah will replace or change their evils with goodnesses and Allah is all forgiving, all merciful. It's a small commentary on this. Allah says, Yuhibbul muhsineen. Walladina idha fa'alu fahishatan aw dhalamu anfusahum dhakaru laha fastaghfaru lidhunubihim. Allah loves the virtuous. And those who, when they commit an act of corruption, wrong themselves and remember Allah and plead for forgiveness for, them, for their sins. Two people he likes. Two people he loves. One is the person who is the muhsin, who does ihsan. Now, ihsan is described as an act of goodness that goes beyond itself. I'll give you an example. Somebody asks you for directions. An act of goodness is you can give them the directions. You can tell them where to go. Another act of goodness is actually going with them to where they're going or going some part of the way. That is going above and beyond. This is ihsan. This is ihsan. Um, you Somebody needs money, they need 10 pounds, you give them 15, this is Ihsan. Ihsan comes from the word Hasan or Hosn, which means beauty. It's an act of beauty. It's a beautiful deed, this is Ihsan. When somebody treats you so nice, so nice, and you know that they, do not, they did not have to do that, okay? 
How do you feel? You feel about that person that is, they are the, one of the most beautiful people in the world. You get to like that person because naturally a human being likes beauty. Most human beings love beauty. And this is a beauty in action. This is Ehsan, a beautiful deed. You're not just doing a good deed. Many of the people say khair, which is a good deed, is like justice. You, 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 you do to the extent that has to be done to rectify something. We're talking about rectification, remember. Okay, in response to something. But Ihsan is beyond justice. Ihsan is beautiful. Because you do more than you should have done. Allah, Allah orders us to be muhsin to, be, to our parents. Not to just do good to them. To, be a, to, be, to practice Ihsan with our parents. Allah says here he loves the muhsineen. He loves the people who do Ihsan. And it is natural because you love beauty. People love beauty. What is love? Sometimes love is described as the attraction to beauty. You move towards beauty. You're, re you're re repulsed to ugly things. And Allah loves the muhsineen. The other thing that the other person that Allah loves is a person when they have done a corruption. Fahsha. A corruption. Well, you know, English is not that great to, to describe these things. But fascia is described as in, in some by some of the philosophers as doing something that's against the natural order. Doing something that uh, doesn't really fit with what should be done. This is fascia. And when a person does this, or wrongs themselves, do a sin that hurts themselves, and they seek repentance, Allah loves that particular person. Now, the interesting word here is love. And why is, it lo why is love so interesting? You see, because here, you are the object of love. You are the beloved. Usually, Allah is our beloved. But now here, you are the beloved of Allah. And you know in your, exa in your life how you behave towards somebody that is your beloved. When you just get married, for example, you know, and you fall in love, what happens to you? You could be sitting in this lecture right now, but not be hearing a word I'm saying. Because your mind isn't here. Your mind is with the beloved. You're distracted. This is, I'm just giving a sort of an example of what it means to be the beloved. Indeed, you have a, 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 a hadith quoted by Aisha who said to the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi wa ali, It seems to me that your Lord hastens to fulfill your every need. You know when we pray to Allah, we say Allah help us with something, it takes a little while, but with the Prophet, boom, it happens. Because he's the beloved. There's a hadith that says, my servant, Allah is a hadith, a hadith Qudsi, where Allah says, my servant does not cease or continues or is incessant to uh, do his wajibat and his supererogatory acts of worship, like his nawafil, like the mustahabat, until I love him. And when I love him, I become the eyes by which he sees, the hand by which he acts, the tongue by which he speaks, and so forth. And when he asks me, I will give it to him. This is what happens to the beloved of Allah. That you merge with him in a certain sense. You see with his eyes. This is what love is. Love is when you want to be one with the person that you love. And Allah is saying, you become one with me. Your perception, everything, 
is based upon your connection with me. And in the next verse, Allah talks about those who have faith and act righteously. Some Allah would replace their evils with goodnesses. You know, we don't have a word evils. You know, I put that word in, in there, sayyat and goodnesses. Because there's, no, there's, there's more than one thing that is good and more than one thing that is evil. Allah would replace that. He will change you into something beautiful. That has Hassan in it, that has beauty in it. To the extent that when the good people see you, they fall in love with you. And this is what happens with the Holy Prophet. We call him Habibullah, the beloved of Allah. And you had people who had some goodness in their heart whenever they saw him, they fell in love with him. And this is where Islam wants to take us. And this is the mystery of the Sunnah. The mystery of the Sunnah is because he's the Habibullah, he's the beloved of Allah, you try to be like him. You know, if you know, we, we see this in our lives, you know, you want, you want to get the affections or the attention of somebody that is important, and they're not paying you any attention, you tend to look at the person they are paying attention to, and you imitate them. And then you get the attention of that, that person you want to get. The sunnah, is, the sunnah is based on that. Why do we do the sunnah? We only do the sunnah in order to get close to Allah. We don't do the sunnah just because it's just a, it's a perfect way. You ask somebody, why do you do the sunnah? Many people might not be able to give you a proper answer. Because it's, you know, if you don't do the sunnah, you'll go to hell. No, you do the sunnah because you want Allah to love you just like he loved the prophet. So he puts on perfume, you put on perfume. He grows a beard, you grow a beard. He does the night prayer, you do the night prayer. Qurbatan lillah, to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi said, that repentance erases whatever precedes it. And he also said, He said, repentance purifies the hearts and washes away sins. Purifies the hearts and washes the way away sins. This is what Tawbah does. The word Taba is the word from which Tawbah comes. And Taba means to turn. It means to turn. When a person repents, they turn towards Allah. When they do a sin, it's like them turning away from Allah. But the relationship between us and Allah are reciprocal. And there are so many hadith that indicate this. One of the names of Allah is called a tawab the one who is always turning. So the relationship between us and Allah is like this. You turn away from Allah, he turns away from you. You turn towards him, he turns towards you. And one of the things, one of the operating factors for, for Allah to turn towards you is purification. You have to be, in a certain sense, like God, God-like. God is pure, you try to be pure according to how he says you should be pure. God is beautiful, you try to be beautiful. It's a great, a great hadith, I'm sure, I'm sure most of you know it. Allah is beautiful and loves beauty. He doesn't like you to be all, you know, I uh, can't remember the word they used back in America. Grunge. Doesn't expect you to be grunge. Okay? He expects you always to be well-groomed and looking sharp. 
looking nice and smelling good and having great akhlaq. Allah loves that stuff. You don't walk around with bad akhlaq. You don't walk around looking all, you know, rubber dub scrub. You look good. You look great. And the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi was like this. Imam Jafra Sadiq. As you say, as you say back home in America, we used to be clean. We used to dress clean. Not clean in terms of taharat, yeah, that, that too, but well put together. That's what Muslims should be. Always great uh, uh, examples. And the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Laisa shay'un ahabba ila Allah me mu'minin ta'ibin aw mu'minatin ta'ibatin. There is nothing more beloved to Allah than a penitent believing man or a penitent believing woman. A woman who is doing tawbah. A man who is doing tawbah. Nothing more beloved to Allah than this. You have a very interesting hadith Qudsi where Allah is talking to Prophet Dawood. And many of the hadith where Allah is talking to Prophet Dawood are hadith of Urfan. Very, very important hadith. And Allah tells Dawood, He says, if the person who turns away from me, meaning a person who turns away from him, knows how much I wait for him. He 